everybody, Dragon Movie Guy here. Welcome to the Dragon Movie Guy show. It's hard to believe that it's time to talk April movie releases, but it's time to talk April 2023 movie releases. According to Wikipedia, there are 25 movies coming out to streaming and on demand and in theaters in the month of April 2023, and there's even more than that. Joining me today to talk April movie releases is someone that sent me his top 11 list for April, and I didn't even recognize three or four names on that list. Joining me today is someone who just passed 5,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, Lost in the Real. He's also a co-founding member of the Cinema Squad. Please welcome Sean Jackson. Welcome to Dragon Movie Guy. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Brian. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, you know, we've we've been kind of YouTube friends for a couple of years now, and uh, it's it's yeah. sort of weird because this is the first time uh, we've talked to each other directly, other than like through Instagram or or YouTube comment chats or live streams or all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it, it's that's so that's strange. You're right. It is the first time, now, but it is a lot of fun because it's able to shrink the distances between people. Because it used to be, yeah. you know, when we when we were all growing up, if you were a huge movie fan, there might be one or two others around you. In this era, we can we can go on a live stream and talk to people that are thousands, hundreds, or even thousands of miles away about all the movies that we love and care about. I am just really excited now to talk about the movies we're most excited for coming up in april uh i looked at your list your list is better than my list um no, I, no least, not even a little bit well I, I well i say that because um i i think you and i have similar tastes in, in a lot of ways and in, in that we both mm -hmm. love a lot of indie movies and yes. i think i i think that you know, i with my fandom I'm I have I'm I'm a bigger fan than like 90% of people, but the final 10% are way better at being a fan. Like like I am a I'm a huge fan of Star Wars, but mm -hmm. like the top 10% of Star Wars fans are the ones that can quote every scene. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not me. <laughs> yeah. So like so like when I look at your channel and I you see all of the indie movies that you cover, and I I'd be like, oh, I heard of that one. I'm like, God, I've, I've never even seen that one before. So when you sent me your April list. I was like, okay, okay, we've got some of the, and I'm like, there's like three of the movies on this list that I've never even heard of before, and I was looking up movies opening in April, so yes, <laughs> so thank you for coming on. I think uh, I, I really love this list, and and I love some of the choices you made. So um, the way we're uh, the way I want to do this, or at least try it out today, and at the Oscars they brought out a, a team to introduce uh, two categories at once. So I figure if it's good enough for the Oscars, and everyone seemed to like the Oscars this year. Let's try it uh, the same way on this pod or on this live stream podcast. Let you start first and do eleven and ten, and then I'll do my eleven and ten. Then you'll do your nine and eight, my nine and eight, and back and forth, and then that'll that'll lead us to build up to our number one movies uh, for the presentation. Let's start with your number ten, uh, eleven and your number ten, and I have a uh, picture and a label uh, for your uh, eleven and ten. So uh Perfect. what what is your number 10 and why is it on the list well let's start with number 11 oh yeah sorry 11 um, yes <laughs> Here, i don't even stick my own rules right after i say them and i'm like yeah let's skip 11 and go straight to 10 what, yes, what is, 11. What, yeah what, what is your number 11 my number 11 most anticipated film for april 2023 is chupa uh from netflix and this is uh, this is a fun one, I think. So it's basically a twist on the chupacabra story, but instead of it being like a scary chupacabra, it's like this little cute chupacabra uh, that these kids find. And it's almost like an E.T. Spielbergian type movie on Netflix. So uh, I'm a sucker for the coming of age Spielbergian type movie. Um, does it look a little cheesy? Yes. And Netflix is so hit or miss nowadays, uh, but it looks like a lot of fun and maybe a good family film uh, for the month of April. And I, uh, when I watched the trailer for this, I was like, yeah, that, is, that does like the, the Chupacabra looks like, it looks like a cross between Lilo and Stitch <laughs> and um, Pikachu, like from the Detective Pikachu. Yes. Like, 
it kind of felt like that. But somehow it looks – it doesn't quite look photoreal, but it actually looks – somewhere between cartoonish and photoreal so it actually looks yeah like pretty... enough that you are gonna believe in this character yeah and, and so where the, the the actors in the film uh believe it and uh like you're you're saying the uh the uh it, yeah it, it looks like a fun coming of age story with a lot of action and a lot of um a lot of chase sequences and stuff too yes mm -hmm. yes absolutely and uh, there's a lot of <laughs> discourse online because chupa in Spanish means to suck. So the internet is of course going insane saying this movie is gonna suck and whatnot. So, you know, it might suck, but it looks like a lot of fun for the kids and I'm on board too. Yeah, I just, yeah, hope it, it hope it, uh, the quality is good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hope the film doesn't suck. You never know with Netflix. Th this is true, this is very true. My number 10 film is Chevalier, uh, which I feel like has been kind of pushed around on the release schedule for quite a while now. Um, but it, star it stars um, uh, Kelvin Harrison Jr., uh, who I think is incredible. He's in, uh, he was in Waves. And he's just one of those actors who has been around in the last couple of years, who's like slowly gaining steam. And I think he's just incredible. Uh, so excited to see him in this. Uh, I think it's a really, it's based on a true story about this uh, kind of uh, illegitimate son of this slave and a plantation owner. And he kind of makes his own in high society way back in the day and becomes this incredible uh, musician. So it's, it looks like a really interesting true story that I'm excited to see. Yeah, I, I agree. And this is actually also on my list too. It, uh, it, I, I, I also saw it, there's so many movies the last two years that have moved around where like a, a, a trailer will come out and you go, oh, that that looks good when you're watching something else and then you forget about it. And then like, yeah, wasn't that movie going to come out? And then it never does. And yeah, it's, it, it's good that we're finally getting this movie because um, there's so many other uh, there's so many of those films that you see the trailer and you're like, oh, that looks great. And then three years later, you're like, whatever happened to. Right. Yeah. It feels like that's happening to a lot of movies nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> My number 11 is, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, which I am 47 years old. So, it you know, a girl's coming of age story is sort of a weird choice <laughs> to, for me no. to put on the list. But there's something about coming of age stories that I love and find fascinating. And I never read the book, but it, it's a book that was around and I knew the title and everyone that, that you know, going through when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, everyone knew about this book. A lot of people read it and it was it was sort of in the zeitgeist. It was in the pop culture and it was one that people would talk about. And I never paid that that close attention to it. I was like, all right, yeah, it's, it's Margaret, whatever. Um, but seeing <laughs> seeing this trailer, um, seeing Abby Ryder Fortson go from being Cassie Lang in the first two Ant-Man movies to now um, mm -hmm. growing up. And it's it's interesting seeing her do a coming of age story um, along with Rachel McAdams playing her mom. And it, it's, it's sort of interesting looking at this being uh, a film that's set in the seventies and it's people moving from the city to the suburbs and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that, that entails. So, um, so uh, it, it is, uh, th there's just something about a well done coming of age story that um, I, I like. And I, that's why I'm looking I'm forward to it. I am a sucker for coming of age films and I am a sucker for Judy Bloom. Like, even though like, uh, are you there? God, it's me. Margaret was a little bit before my time. There was a lot of like, uh, what was it? Judy Moody. Or was there was something, one of her other, one of the other Judy Bloom books. So I like grew up with that. Uh, even though I might not have been the prime, uh, person to be reading those novels or books or whatever. Uh, but no, I'm excited for this. And Rachel McAdams like is a gem. So whenever she's in anything, I'm just excited to see her. And it's just weird to see Rachel McAdams as a mom now. I, yeah, it, that's I, where I, we're at. I, I know time works that way, and I know it's it, like <laughs> if you do the math, it doesn't not make sense. But it's still weird seeing Rachel McAdams as a mom of a teenage daughter. It's just it just seems yeah. seems off to me. Um, <laughs> my number ten is somewhere in Queens, 
with Ray Romano and they have a teenage son who's a basketball star in Queens. And this is Ray Romano's directorial debut. Um, I'm a, I'm a moderate fan of Ray Romano. I love, I, I love the idea of everybody loves Raymond. I didn't really love the execution of it, but I like Ray Romano. I like what he's done and I liked, uh, vinyl. He was great in. So it, it's, it's fun to see actors get the chance to direct a film. And I, I love watching him with Laurie Metcalf. That's it. The, the mom of Sheldon, Sheldon's mom. Uh, Laurie Metcalf yes. is right. Yes. Uh, Laurie Metcalf as as his wife, as the mother of uh, of the basketball prodigy growing up in Queens. And just just seeing the son, Ray Romano's son, playing for a basketball scholarship, getting a girlfriend and his big Italian family doesn't quite like the girlfriend distracting him from getting a scholarship. So <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so that so that is my number ten. Um, have, did you see the trailers for this one? I have. Yeah, and it was. I was gonna see it last year. It came out at South by Southwest. I think. Pretty sure it was South by Southwest. It might have been Tribeca. But uh, I was excited for this one. And Ray Romano is so. I, I don't know how I feel about everybody loves Raymond, but um, he was in The Big Stick. And I love that film and I thought he was great in it. So I like this whole resurgence of Ray Romano and Lori Metcalf to me is like, she is incredible. When she got her uh, time in Lady Bird, I was so happy to see her, you know, get that Oscar nomination. And um, so definitely excited to see this movie and to see those two together. I think they'll work really well off of each other. And, and you're right. Lori Metcalf is just, she's been around for forever. And, yes, and, not, and she's not she, hilarious. Yeah, and she's always great in everything she does. She was great as Roseanne's sister, but she was good about yes. not taking the attention away from Roseanne. She was great as Sheldon's mom. It's it's her mm -hmm. real life daughter that's in Young Sheldon. Um, yeah, yeah Lori, Lori Metcalf. I love more Lori Metcalf, so I'm yes. I'm excited for uh, her in that. So my number nine is Ghosted. Now, I'm not 100% sure how excited I am for this movie. <laughs> uh, so it stars Chris Evans and Anna de Armas. And, uh, you know, coming off of, they just got out of uh, doing The Gray Man together, which was a Netflix movie that uh, cost, you know, $300 million or something crazy like that. I don't know if anyone remembers it. <laughs> um, and this kind of looks like, almost like the gray man, but with like a little bit of comedy mixed into it. Uh, I like the idea of this story of this normal guy, you know, Chris Evans is playing a normal guy this time and he is being ghosted by this girl. So it starts off as a romantic comedy, but then you find out she's like a CIA agent or whatever. Um, and Anna Darm is kicking ass like, okay, it looks like a lot of fun. I probably would not pay to go see it in theaters but I'm excited to watch it on uh, on streaming. And it's it is one of her first uh, role, movies to come out after the Oscar no nomination yeah. for Blonde. And there's something interesting about the role reversal uh, of seeing Captain America get ghosted. You know, here he is the yes. the the He Man Alpha Male, you know, standard by which all men are judged, and he's getting ghosted. Yeah, <laughs> and goes <laughs> goes all around. And we have uh, Dexter Fletcher is directing it, and he did uh, Rocket Man and Eddie the Eagle with Taron Egerton in both of those movies. And I feel like that's an interesting choice. I, I, I like both of those movies and kind of excited to see him uh, stretch to a more blockbuster type movie. I think it could be a lot of fun. I agree. And, and this one is also on my list. And interesting, too, that Apple TV is, is getting, uh, getting into the blockbuster game. I, your number eight movie is Polite Society. And this movie just uh, premiered at Sundance a couple of months ago. Uh, so it got rave reviews coming out of Sundance and it is like a Bollywood uh, spin on Pride and Prejudice meets John Wick meets Ocean's Eleven, uh, whatever that means to you. And it just looks like a whole lot of fun uh, the action looks super kinetic and really well done. And, uh, you know, for it premiering at Sundance, it definitely looks like a 
you know, very well put together action film uh, that also is very tongue in cheek as well. So uh, I'm excited for that one. Yeah, that, that that your description alone of Pride and Prejudice meets John Wick. That that is that that is that is that should go on the poster right there. Uh, this is one that I was jealous of. Uh, this is one of the two or yes. three that I was jealous of when I when I saw your list, and I was like, "Damn it, that's a really good one." Because I I haven't heard of this film, and watching the trailer for it, there is something interesting, you know, because we're we're both Americans, so I think you know we yeah. we get a little bit American centric in our just inner worldview, and so to mm-hmm. see a an Indian family that's in England that's been in England for a while. So they're, they're English, you know, but of Indian yeah. descent to see, to see a film in that subculture uh, is sort of an interesting thing. So you still have the, uh, the Bollywood influence, but you also have the fact that these are kids that are grown up in England. So they're, they're English, you know, they're, they're of yeah. Indian descent, but they are English. It's interesting to look at, that call that kind of a culture clash or culture offset uh from an american perspective the the visuals and the action and everything in that trailer looks amazing uh yeah. so yeah that, that looks that looks like a lot of fun yeah i'm excited i think it's probably focus features unfortunately has a really bad track record in uh marketing and doing well in theaters in the last couple of years uh, but they had some of the best movies of last year with The Outfit and with Vengeance. So, you know, I hope people go see this movie. It and, looks like a lot of fun. And and this is one that comes out uh, uh, April 28th. And I did put in brackets that it's in limited release. So yeah. I would say wherever someone is, look for wherever the theater is that plays the indie movies. And there's a chance that it will be there. But there are a yeah. lot of movies coming out in April. So even the indie movie theaters uh, may or may not have some of the indie movies on our list. My number nine movie is One True Loves. This is a love triangle story with Philippa Sue and Simu Liu from, um, uh, from Shang-Chi. And the, basically the, the premise is, is that Philippa Sue's character falls in love with a guy and he goes off and is presumed dead. So she has to move on with her life and she finds out that there's this guy, Simu Liu, who has been there all along and wow, she actually has feelings for him. So what happens when the guy she, she literally left for dead or was that was left for dead when he went off and they thought he died? What happens with this love triangle when he comes back and he's like, hey, guys, I'm here. And she's like, yeah, I met somebody. <laughs> so it's 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 kind of a little bit like the scenario from it's sort of like Castaway where where he's been stuck on the island. And so he comes back. He's like, hey, Helen Hunt. And she's like, yeah, I'm remarried. Uh, <laughs> sorry so, about it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. But you have your life now. <laughs> Uh, so there's a little bit of that going on in this trailer. It's kind of a low budget look to it, but there is mm-hmm. something about the, the, the love triangle. Um, Philippa Sue has been in a couple of other things the last couple of years and you know, she, her stars in the rise. She's likable. Yes. It's also interesting seeing Simu Liu in as the, uh, as the middle school band teacher, um, as, as someone who was in band in junior high and high school myself, there is sort of a, a affinity that I have for that, uh, that, uh, that kind of a class. So uh, mm-hmm. all of that together, uh, you know, it's, it's why uh, it is my number nine movie on this list. I I'm just excited to see Simu Lu kind of just spread his, first of all, I'm excited to see him as Shang-Chi again, because that was probably one of my more favorite films from the, that last phase of Marvel. Uh, but I'm excited to see him in other projects. And this looks like an interesting one. Definitely. It definitely looks a little low budget. Like you had mentioned, so I'm not sure where it's going to, you know, end up on the, you know, one star to four star scale, but it looks interesting. And, and, and maybe that's one of those things where having a lower budget can, can work towards the creative and giving creative freedom. I hope. Fingers crossed. Hopefully. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Air colon courting a legend. This is Matt mm. Damon and Ben Affleck together. It's Ben Affleck as... A director again this is uh jason uh jason bateman is also in this film it's basically the origin story for air jordan shoes matt damon's character plays a real life guy who's actually on the radio here in las vegas and i live in las vegas and so i've heard 
the name before, the Sonny Vaccaro. I've heard it all the time, and when I saw this trailer, I was like, why is that name familiar? It's like, oh, it's the guy from the radio. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, this is playing real life people. Uh, ben Affleck is playing Phil Knight, the the founder of Nike, and this is them uh, coming up with Michael Jordan. It's I don't know if it's a biopic, if it's a biopic about shoes, but right. <laughs> somehow this is a biopic about the birth of one of the most popular shoe lines in history and its attachment to Michael Jordan. So there, it's a it's a period piece. It's a biopic about shoes. The birth, it's courting a legend in terms of both you know the shoes in the sneakerhead community and um, and Michael Jordan. Obviously, it's got an amazing cast. Jason Bateman's in this film. Uh, Viola Davis is in this film. So um, there there is the risk of being two eighties, and mm. that's why it's not higher on my list. But um, air courting a legend or you know error yeah i don't i don't know why there's nothing that excites me about this movie <laughs> i i i almost think i'm already oversaturated with all of these like the beginning of the brand movies and i feel like there's one coming out every week this year there's like tetris and blackberry and air jordans and it's like okay so is that what the theme of this year is um, the only thing that's definitely interesting me is that cast is amazing. <laughs> and, and, you know, you're right. Uh, like like we, we have so many biopics now that we have biopics about things that are not alive, about cons- yeah, concepts about products. or, or shoes or, mm-hmm. or Tetris. Yeah. You're right. Like we have a biopic about the game Tetris, but yeah. somehow it actually kind of looks good. Um, I know the Tetris movie does look yeah, quite interesting. And, and I, I will fully admit that um, my interest in this film is I, I had a pair of Air Jordans, like not the first, oh. first pair from 1984, but like I had one pair like somewhere like I saved up when I was in high school and bought a pair. And it was a really nice pair of shoes, but it fell apart really quick. Um, so mm-hmm. I... I I, I love the cast in this film and yes. um, I like the subject matter, but it also has that feel where it's possible that this could be a movie that should be the movie within a movie. Mm, yeah. You know, the kind of thing where when I'm watching the trailer, it feels very by the numbers and I'm not so cynical that I don't like trailers done by the numbers, but right. it worries me a little bit that like, well, cue the, cue the eighties music. You know, like da 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 da, uh, like cue the right song, cue the whatever, and then you know, yeah, title card, and then the the character cue the only. nostalgia, yeah, and like, and, and then oh, what's the name? Air Jordan. Yeah, all right, you know, like like it 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 has that feel like oh god, it could be a bust, and I hope it's not. But even you know, even um, even the last duel that brought back Matt Damon and Ben Affleck was, was, was at yeah. least worth watching. So, Oh, know, absolutely. In, in that duo, uh, duo, I trust, I trust they're not going to pull it out, put out a clunker. So mm-hmm. I hope fingers crossed. Um, but it, you know, air should be theoretically, it should be higher on this list, but just watching that trailer, there's something that I'm like, this could be a clunker. I hope it's not, but uh, I still yeah. want to see it. So. It's my number seven, and this could be a clunker, too. We never know. <laughs> um, uh, it's called To Catch a Killer, and it stars uh, Shailene Woodley as kind of like a uh, Clarice Starling-type character who is hunting for a serial killer. Um, it This movie was called Misanthrope, which I think is a way better name and way less generic than To Catch a Killer. Uh, but it also stars Ben Mendelsohn and Giovanna Depo, who was just in Babylon. And the one thing about this movie, there's two things. I'm a sucker for serial killer movies, and this looks right up my alley, like a really like gritty mystery noir. And then also the director um, is he directed this foreign film called wild tales from, I think 2015, uh, that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I'm excited to see him, you know, uh, film in the U S and, uh, it's his first English language feature. So, uh, there's a couple of things going for it. It's also being released by vertical entertainment and they have a not so great track record of movies. Uh, so we'll see how that goes, but I'm curious. 
yeah, I and when I watched the trailer for this, I was um I was a bit mixed. I love Shailene Woodley. I yes. love I love true crime stories and I love the city of Baltimore. But whenever yeah. you have any kind of anything crime related in the city of Baltimore, I automatically think of the wire. And when I think of That's the good. wire, the exact opposite of the wire is Shailene Woodley. So, <laughs> so, so not not that she can't do drama or, or you know right. gritty kind of thing, but like yeah, I, I don't think of the wire and Shailene Woodley in the same sentence. But uh, yeah, it, uh, and I like that uh, that analogy to um, um, uh, the Silence of the Lambs and her being sort of a based off or you know being influenced by uh, the Clarice Starling character. I agree yeah. about Vertical. Um, there's something about the bargain bin at Best Buy. That when you're going yes. through the Blu-ray section of the bargain bin at Best Buy, and you know you look down and there's like there's some random like you know you recognize the the actor on the cover and then you look and like there's something off about that title art on the cover and then you look on the back and it's like, oh it's Vertical Entertainment. It's uh, Vertical Entertainment. Yeah, and not not that that's necessarily bad or anything, but it, it, you know it's just it's it's lower lower budget. Um, it, and it usually has they usually have some like well-known stars who haven't done movies in a while <laughs> or like they they used to be a-list now they're c-list stars uh and they kind of have like a mid-tier budget but none of them are all that good uh but there are some they do have some good films they yeah. do uh, so yeah. i don't want to discredit the studio uh at all but this could be that movie where they're like hey we got a good movie we're gonna release it and, and you're right. There is there is something to that that mid tier where you know we all, in general you know we all kind of like complain about well it's either blockbusters or nothing, and why mm -hmm. don't we have any kind of uh, mid level budget movies anymore? And that is this is that kind of film where um, you know you can root for a mid level budget film to get made yes. and and hope that it's good. And um, you know it's funny you're thinking like stars of 20 years ago like like for some reason I was picturing Steve Gutenberg. Uh, being in a long <laughs> line of vertical entertainment films, uh, straight yes. to Blu-ray, straight to DVD, straight to streaming. Uh, so. <laughs> and, and the other that was the other thing I was thinking about with, to catch a killer. I was like, "Where's Chris Hansen? Like, if, if there's <laughs> if there's a title for a movie that screams a Chris Chris Hansen uh, uh, cameo, this this is it. So I I hope that Chris you Hansen catch a killer. Like, hello, I'm Chris Hansen. <laughs> Like everyone's scram scram. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, let's move on to your number six film. Yes, my number six film is Renfield. And I mean, I don't know how you could not put this on your list of most anticipated films for April because it is. We got <laughs> Nicolas Cage being Crazy Cage as Dracula. And also Nicholas Holt is uh is amazing and i i've loved him in everything he's done in the past couple of years i think he's such a solid up-and-coming actor uh and we just have a kind of twist on the dracula story that looks like very fun kind of violent uh but also just uh you know very aware of itself so uh this one just looks like a blast this one is on my list as well and um the the first half of the trailer was one that um uh, I was like, well, you know, and then Nicolas Cage comes in, like, f going full Nicolas Cage. And I'm like, oh, yes. that's what this movie is. Like, it's it's not something yes. else. Like, and uh, I also, the, the other thing I was noticing from the trailer is the guy that's on the series, Ghost. He plays a Revolutionary War um, guy who's, like, a rival of, like, you know, George Washington. To see him as the guy who's leading the therapy group session. I was like, oh, oh like, he got the most laughs out of me in that trailer for sure. Yeah, and he, he over is, Aquafina. Yeah, he, yeah, <laughs> both of them great, but uh, but he in particular, I can't remember his name, but he's a uh, he's kind of an up and coming guy, and and um, I'm you know I I've liked the last couple of things I've seen with him too. So that that's the other thing that grabbed nice. my attention from. Uh, I've heard Ghost is really good. It it is really fun. It's based off a British show. It's on CBS, and it's. Uh, single camera comedy and it's actually got a pretty decent sized cast and it's clearly shot up in canada but it's got uh utkash ambergar i'm butchering mm -hmm. his name but the guy that was in free guy um yeah it's got him and uh rose mckyver who my number seven is chevalier um 
I, you know, I was a little bit mixed when I first saw the trailers for this one. I love Kelvin Harrison Jr. Um, mm-hmm. He was in Cyrano. Yeah, Cyrano. The, yeah, he was in Cyrano as the uh, the good looking guy who Cyrano is like, oh, she can't be with me. Look at him. He's so handsome. He was the handsome guy um, yeah. in Cyrano. Did a great job in that film. Still being like a little bit also being the more obvious choice as the romantic interest for uh, Roxanne. Uh, so seeing him in this trailer, um, I wasn't quite sure at first, like, you know, it kind of has all the period piece stuff and there's the, the French revolution is kind of a cool setting, but that makes me think of Les Mis and this doesn't look like a musical. And there's also the, the whole thing of like that, that period of also of where it's a musician. Well, it's like, well, is this just another, is just this just another, like a Solieri versus Mozart thing. Mm-hmm. And, but then as as the trailer goes along and you see a little bit more of the the character elements to it the outsiderness of it that's universal i think i think everyone can relate to an outsider story and yes. a, a well-told story as a whole and yes some of the set extensions the cgi set extensions look a little cheesy it's probably hopefully some, they'll update those before it comes out yeah, yeah ho- <laughs> hopefully I think he fits well into this role, at least what we see in the trailers so far. And he's a likable actor that I'm rooting for to do well in this film. So um, it is number seven on my list. It it could have been higher, if not for the CGI matte paintings. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is still on my list. My number six movie is Rare Objects. This is a film directed by Katie Holmes. It is actually not her directorial directorial debut. This is actually her third feature film. And it really? is it is about Katie Holmes as an older woman, well, you know, woman in her 30s, 40s, meeting a younger woman where they've been receiving uh, mental health therapy. And hmm. the girl or the younger woman gets released and has to go back to her family and has to contend with the expectations of her family and Katie Holmes as the director and as the older role model sort of AA sponsor type role, even though I don't think there's any sort of addiction in this story, um, is sort of her mentor, her way, guiding her back to her family, you know, coexisting with her family, even though you know, her family loves her, but you know, they, they got on her nerves some. Um, getting out of rehab, getting out of therapy, trying to go back to your family, even though they're sort of the str- the, the the source of the stress, and mm-hmm. uh, that that really interests me. Along with Katie Holmes in the director's chair, I thought when I first saw this this trailer, I thought that this was her directorial debut, but I looked it up, and this is actually her third film. What other director. movies has she directed? Uh, she directed one film that was uh, a COVID era film from twenty that came out last year, twenty twenty two. Uh, okay. I, I didn't see the trailers for it, but I, it looked like it was one of those where everyone kind of shot it in isolation. And then there was right. another little indie film about a, being a single mom where she was the single mom. And it was a, um, a film that came out 2015, 2016. This one actually looks like it has some good heart to it. And yeah. VOD. Uh, so Rare Objects is the name of the film. And Katie Holmes is the director and co-star and have you heard of this film i have not seen this trailer um i will say it does it sounds a little heavy-handed and katie holmes as a director i mean i didn't even know like you that she had directed other things but the story sounds solid so i am curious definitely to check that out it it looks pretty well grounded and it's interesting because you get a lot of close-ups on katie holmes where you're seeing you're seeing the lines in her face. And as someone who is, you know, who's known as a, as a beautiful leading actress to show those lines <laughs> in a film she's yeah. directing and knows exactly what the close up looks like. Um, it's, it's a gutsy move. And it's, it's one that kind of grabbed my attention of like, Oh, like not only are they not doing digital touch up, but whatever wrinkles are on her face, she's fully showing as the director in charge of the lens so um it's that that alone kind of grabbed my attention and then seeing the other story elements in the trailer your number five the movie film. that's probably everyone's number <laughs> one for april it, it's on my list too. uh is <laughs> uh the super mario brothers movie um i mean how we've been waiting for this movie to come out forever like obviously everyone's we just it's been um, 
expected. You know, like they're going to do a Super Mario Brothers movie. Um, they already did one. <laughs> that was right. Awful. Well, <laughs> the less said about that, the better. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love that they've gone the animation route. And I mean, they, w- they would have to after the live action one. But uh, the animation looks beautiful. Uh, it looks like they've definitely put a lot of care into making you know, all the fans of the games, uh, you know, have a lot of Easter eggs in this. Um, I just, I have trepidation with this film only because it is illumination and nothing against the studio, but the only movies I like from them are the sing movies, which sing two, I think is great. Sing one. And then maybe despicable me one, but all of their other movies are just pure cash grab to me. And I'm worried that this might be, you know, another just cash grab. Like, it's a lot of like, in your face, here's the Easter eggs, you know, here you go, fans of the games, you know, and not have like an actual interesting story uh, or, you know, something that you can connect to on a human uh, or or emotional level. So I'm going in, not expecting a lot, but hoping that it's, it's entertaining. This one is also on my list. It is a little bit higher, but the fact that this is, this is Illumination, I have mixed feelings on Illumination. Mm-hmm. I try and couch my expectations because we all think that everything should be the same quality as Pixar. And if you think yeah. about the fact that Pixar <laughs> comes out of Lucasfilm from the 80s and Toy Story came out in like 95. So, yeah. to, so Pixar as a studio has a decade and a half more experience making films than illumination does so for illumination to come out in 2007 8 with the first despicable me movie they're 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 facing a uh, they're they're having to make up a lot of ground in terms of animation quality and an audience yeah. that is expecting pixar level animation that's quality. fair so most of the earlier films in Illumination are not as high quality as Pixar. I think it's a little unfair by my stand, you know, when I really think about it. And if, if you if you look at the highlight points of the, of the Illumination films, um, you know, the, the, so many great characters and good moments that when I see yeah. the trailer for Super Mario Brothers movie and the animation looks at least a level or two higher... It- it looks I, incredible. Yeah, and I, I didn't. I it, I had to start looking up the, the the film to realize. Oh, this is illumination. This does not look like a quote unquote illumination style film. So yeah. the fact that they're kind of stepping it up a little bit um, is is what I my, was sort of finding interesting. My problem with illumination has nothing to do with their animation quality. It has everything to do with story. Um, I think, and I, I personally feel like Illumination, their best film is the first Despicable Me, which was their first feature film. I think that movie is phenomenal. And I still, to this day, am obsessed with that movie. Uh, it's where I feel like they almost got so caught up in like the minions are making money. So let's make movies about minions and dogs are fun. People love dogs. Let's make a shitty movie about dogs. Like, I feel like they got so caught up in that that they lost their like originality and their creativity along the way that's kind of where i am with them yeah and and i have not seen um the pets movie i've seen the trailers for it but that yeah that's another one where i I saw the trailers and i was like "Eh." (laughs) yeah yes this one i'm really excited about um it is being released by neon who they're kind of like A24 and IFC Midnight for me. Like if they're releasing a film, I'm going to pay attention because the, the people working at those studios, they know what they're doing. Um, so very excited that it's a neon release uh, and they only have a couple a year, but it's uh, how to blow up a pipeline. And uh, I think it already has like over 30 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and it's at, at 100% right now. Uh, and it's like this ecological thriller about these kind of like radical young kids who are trying to make a giant statement um, against uh, like this oil corporation, basically. Uh, so definitely lots of political statements in there and it might turn some people off, which is fine. 
Um, but it just looks like a really solid, like almost like hurt locker type thriller. Uh, so I'm really excited for this. Sasha Lane is in it, who was in American Honey. And Sasha Lane, I don't know. I see her. I'm like, I'm interested. <laughs> so uh, this looks like a really, really solid movie. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, when when, he, when you put it on the list, I, I looked up the trailer and um, American Honey. That that is one that I haven't seen, but it's on my list of movies to watch. So good. Um, I I like the Hurt Locker analogy that you bring up because um, that that now that you say that it it does evoke some memories as to yeah I could see how that would be a similar style film. Uh, you know, I, I'm not huge into politics and, you know, making yeah. statement things. So I, it is not on my list, but it does look like it is really well put together. And, it, you know, mm-hmm. when, when you look at, um, films that are asking tough questions and mm-hmm. somewhere between making a statement and posing a question, um, you know, the, the old thing is where one, per, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, the old line. So yeah. one person's environmental activist is another person's eco-terrorist. That, that is an interesting question to pose. And it looks like it's really well uh, put together in this film. So that, uh, so that yeah, I could totally see how um, that w- it would be, it'll be an interesting watch because the, the filmmaking in the trailer looks really well done. And I, I'm not familiar with yes. any of the other actors, but, but yeah, I, I, I echo a lot of what you said there too um, in that, uh, the, as yeah. long as they're not beating us over the head with the messaging, that's what I, I hate. As long as they're not doing that and they're like actually posing those questions like you brought up, Ryan, then I'm going to be on board. I'm hypersensitive to anything that's preachy. And mm-hmm. it, it's not just anything preachy. It's st- the stuff that I agree with that's preachy is even worse. Yeah. Like if it's if it's something that I can kind of like – like I disagree with, I can just throw it out of my brain. But if it's something that I agree with, like like if if I were to do uh, a, a preachy you know film about uh, drinking more beer and watching football, I would hate that film. Like if, <laughs> if it was preachy. So yeah. So so that, that's just me. I am hypersensitive to anything political, like or preach, especially preachy. Um, so that's why it's not on my list, but I, I agree with it's you. I, I will say, I don't want to discredit the movie though. Cause from what I've seen and what I've heard so far, it doesn't look like it's going to be preachy, but it could reach that level. We haven't seen it yet. Yeah, and, and maybe that's just me being hypersensitive. And um, you know, my, my eyes are constantly rolling at anything that's preachy and trying to send a message. So, <laughs> so that's why it's not on my list, but I, I agree a hundred percent with you that it looks really well done. And Neon Studios does have a really good reputation. And um, I also, I love A24. I love IFC. IFC and mm-hmm. IFC Midnight, um, yeah. two different branches of, of the same corporate arm. So um, I love both of those studios. So uh, if you're comparing the two, then I, you know, I, I trust in your, uh, uh, your, uh, your, your judgment, your taste in film. So thank you, my friend. Yes. My number five is Renfield. As, as you had already yes. mentioned, this is Nicholas Holt. This is Nicholas Cage. Um, you know, the first time I saw the trailer for this, yeah, okay. We could do the support group thing. That's, you know, that's a pretty, that, that it's getting to the point where that's an overused trope, but it can still be funny. And then Nicholas mm-hmm. Cage popping in, in full <laughs> Nicholas Cage. The only thing that would be better is if we had Andy Sandberg popping in as Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage. <laughs> you, you know, like this is the type of film that um, when we uh, when the Nicolas Cage movie came out last year, where it was Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage, I I, I wanted a movie within a movie um, that was something like this, where mm-hmm. you would see Nicolas Cage going full Nicolas Cage in the movie about Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage. So th- this is the type of movie that I would have expect- expected uh, for, uh, the, uh, for that film. But uh, in this film, um, you know, I-, I love Nicholas Holt. I sometimes forget that he's a British actor because yeah. he does so well playing Beast. He does so well playing Americans that you forget that, like, oh, yeah, he probably has an ascot somewhere. Like, he's, he, <laughs> he actually has that British cultural acting tradition. Um, so to see him playing Renfield with – using a British accent. I'm like, that's beast. He doesn't have, Oh, well he actually is British. So like, I, 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 <laughs> he's being so. himself. Yeah. So, um, so seeing him, uh, you know, seeing the, the two of them together. Um, I, 
I had heard the name Renfield before somewhere, but it's been so long, and there's been so many Dracula movies that when you mm-hmm. see Bram Stoker's Dracula, you see all these different uh, Dracula movies, the Renfield character is there. But it never gets much focus. So the fact yeah. that the supporting character in a Dracula story is getting a story in and of himself, almost like an interview with a vampire kind of thing. Um, obviously, different style of films completely. Oh, yeah. But having that different perspective, that different take on a well-known character, putting that well-known character in the background, letting Nicolas Cage go insane, and uh, and putting uh, putting Nicholas Holt in the foreground going, can you believe this guy? Uh, <laughs> you know, sort of like a comedy duo sort of thing. Uh, that it's such a, fan, a fascinating, interesting idea, and um, and yeah, and then the, the the actor from Ghosts popping up in the trailer too, uh, also kind of grabbed my interest. So, uh, Renfield is my number five film for uh, April. I also I want to mention too. I think it's funny because I think of Renfield, and I think it's a movie that's very self aware. And it knows exactly what it is, and it's targeting a certain audience. And it's Universal. And Universal just came out with Cocaine Bear, which I feel like is very much so the same. It knows what it is, very self aware. So I think Universal Pictures are kind of etching out this kind of like niche of mid budget films, but with such a unique twist or premise to what we're used to that it's like making people excited to go see movies again um, and spend money on a movie that might not be a blockbuster. So I'm excited of, at what universal pictures is doing. I, you know, I, I forgot that cocaine bear was a universal pictures uh, movie. The, the, the cynicist in me would say that all they're doing is trying to come up with a cocaine bear ride for universal studios, which would be <laughs> an amazing attraction. And I'm sure kids under 21 would not be allowed, but they would probably still sneak in. <laughs> now coming, Cocaine Bear Ride at Universal Studios. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I agree with you too. Like Universal, it, it, it's funny when you think about like the, the classic um, monster era of Universal Studios going back to the 40s, 50s, all that kind of stuff. And how this kind of follows a little bit in that tradition and, and going a little bit more of the comedy route. But uh it, it definitely looks like they have the fun um, the fun aspect to it. So I, I, yes. I really hope that this is a, I hope uh, that this is as advertised. Um, you know you can you never know for sure with a uh, with a trailer. Sometimes the uh, trailer is a completely inaccurate representation of what the finest final film is. Yeah. Most of the time that's not the case, but hopefully, um, fingers crossed, uh, this is actually a comedy. So my number four movie, uh, I think you had it at number five, uh, Super Mario Brothers. Yep. It is my number four movie. Um, I, I, you know, it's funny because I was eight, nine, ten years old, something like that, when Super Mario Brothers, the video game, came out on Nintendo. And that was, like, we didn't have an Atari when I was growing up, so that Nintendo was like... I know my parents definitely regretted getting it for us for Christmas because I I was button mashing uh, you know for a couple of years there on yeah <laughs> on the Super Mario Brothers. Um, then by the time Super Mario uh, by the time Super Mario Bros the the live action film came out in '93, I was in high school by then. So uh, you know that that kind of era moved past me, and I was like, really a Super Mario Brothers movie? Like, ugh. <laughs> And sure enough, that film was awful. So when when I saw that this this trailer was coming out and thinking, you know, like like Sonic was better than it should have been. It's not a great yes. film, but it is it is entertaining. And they did yep. spend all that time to rework the character after every after everyone kind of you know thumb their nose at the at the first trailers and the first design for Sonic. And looking at the character designs, um, there's just something really right about Mm -hmm. the character designs, the animation style um, that Illumination got right. And it it looks like they've so stepped up their game in terms of animation quality and colors and textures. And, you know, they've they've always had the character elements there in their films, but Mm -hmm. this looks like they're just stepping up to a whole nother level. And maybe this is because uh, because Super Mario Brothers and, and Nintendo is such a valuable IP that um, this is them trying to in, uh, impress Nintendo for the rights to other films, I hope, because that's, you know, that's a good positive motivation. 
to have all that uh, that that cash money motivation. Um, but when you watch the trailers and they have just the 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 overload on the cute character moments, the uh, Chris Pratt being the voice of Mario, um, I just I love the combination of you know bright colors, shiny objects, and uh, you know these characters that we all know too you know all too well. Uh, and then, and then the inclusion of Donkey Kong not being the yes. centerpiece, but still there, and probably will go to his own sp- his own spinoff very shortly. Um, yeah, Super Mario <laughs> Brothers. I don't, and you're right. Everyone else probably has it in a, at number one. I'm a little bit more uh, cautious, so it's number four on my list. But I am really looking forward to Super Mario Brothers the movie. Yeah, I'll definitely be seeing it opening weekend, nonetheless. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Your number three film. Evil Dead Rise. Um, my top three are like some of my most anticipated movies of the entire year. So lots of great movies coming out in April. Um, but Evil Dead Rise, this movie looks scary as shit. <laughs> and uh, the just the feedback from people coming out of South by Southwest and all of the different screenings they've had. Sometimes I'll, I'm a little cautious about like people overhyping the movie after they see it because they just want to get their name posted on articles or whatnot that they're praising the movie, you know, so I'm always very trepidatious with that. But this definitely looks like people are loving it uh, for all the right reasons. It looks like a great mix between um, that uh, the Evil Dead remake that came out about 10 years ago and then the Bruce Campbell movies, Sam Raimi movies. So there's a little bit more camp involved, but also it looks bloody and gory and twisted uh, as well. So it just looks like a really nice, happy medium of those two. And uh, this just looks fantastic. Yeah, I, when I watched the trailer for it, there's, there's, uh, there is something in exceedingly creepy about this film. And... Mm-hmm. I am not a particular horror fan. Like if a, if a horror film oh. is done really well, then I'm, you know, then I'll pay attention. Like, like the black phone last year was really, really well done. Um, I agree. But I just, as a, as a genre, I'm not huge into, uh, into, um, uh, into Westerns or into horror films in general, but you know, there's always exceptions mm. like, like, uh, like scream, but this film, it looks really well done. And the whole thing to, of, <laughs> Uh, a mother and her kids and that that bond you know that that that's that sacred that sacred bond between a mother and their kid um to, the way that they play with that bond in the trailer for this film is so wrong and so creepy yeah. and yet somehow it kind of works like it's this this yeah. isn't on my list but it it's so creepy and so well done in the trailer that you're like, oh man, what are they doing? What are they doing to these poor kids and their mom? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing that, um, and it was just, I noticed it when I was taking the the screen grab from the the trailer uh, to set up the, the to set up this uh, podcast. Um, it's interesting because I don't know if they're connected or not, but the smile on the evil character in the trailer or in the, on the poster for Evil Dead Rise is using the smile from smile and I don't, yeah it I definitely don't, looks very familiar yeah and I, I don't know if that's on purpose i don't know if that's what the character is going to look like in the final film because you know there's mostly the, the the trailer had a lot of shadows and, and stuff so i don't know if this is part of the same cinematic universe of horror films um but, i would i definitely would doubt that i just think people smiling or being happy is just creepy to people nowadays <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of goes back to a million ways to die in the West. Uh, like smiling <laughs> in, in pictures can be creepy, uh, but yeah, uh, that, that's uh, that, that was kind of my my two thoughts on the Evil Dead Rise. I, I and I have not seen have you I, I have not seen any of the previous previous Evil Dead films, but um, have you seen? I've seen films? all of them, and what? I mean the it's a, it's an interesting it's this is such an interesting franchise because it's all over the place. It's like a roller coaster, like. One is super low budget and like so campy. And the second one, it's like on the same level, but it had a bigger budget. The third is like an adventure medieval fantasy type movie. And then the fourth one is like this, like almost saw hostile levels of intense violence and 
gore. And then this one is just like, it looks like kind of a mix of all of them together. So it's definitely, definitely an interesting franchise. So is this the sixth film in the Evil Dead franchise? The fifth one. Fifth film. Yeah. Um, so it this this hasn't quite hit the reboot stage uh, that a lot of the horror films had in the 2010s. Then it sounds well. Like. I would say that the last one that came out, which was a decade ago, that one was the the reboot, ah. and that's when they kind of were like, "We're gonna take the campiness of the original and make a really serious, demented, twisted version of it." Is this the series that had Bruce Campbell? Yes. Okay, so this this is. This is why Bruce Campbell shows up in all of the Spider-Man movies. Then this this franchise is is why <laughs> yes, we see him Bruce and Sam Campbell. Raimi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about number two. I'm shocked this is not my number one because it, it was my number one at the beginning of the year, uh, just for the year in general. Um, it's Bo is Afraid from Ari Aster. And I, Hereditary is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, I don't care what the naysayers say. Uh, I think Hereditary is just, it's still to this day, just gives me the heebie-jeebies. And I think it's so well done. Um, Midsummer, or Midsummer, however you want to say it, I'm a little bit less keen on. Um, I think it's a well done movie but i just it's too long for me Mm. um i just not as big on it but i see his vision and i see that he's someone that's doing things that are completely different um in hollywood um and i just think he has a really effed up mind and this Bo is afraid looks no different uh and you got joaquin phoenix in the lead role playing like different ages and whatnot and it looks kind of surrealist, but also horror-ish. And it, I don't know what to think of it, but I'm excited. You know, I this this is also on my list. It's also not number one, but it is very close. I echo everything you just said. It 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 is very surreal looking. It looks it it looks like one that has the potential to be films that people will reference ten years from now when you're talking about your favorite yeah. indie movies from the 2020s. I love Joaquin Phoenix. Um, I you know I'm trying to think of things that I don't like that he's done, and there's it's a very <laughs> short list of I love Joaquin Phoenix. There's there is something too uh, about this film that it uh, you're right it 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 triggers it triggers something, and I don't know what that something is. I don't know quite <laughs> what I feel. But I feel when I watch this trailer, it's it's very disconcerting. Um, you know, when you think about like anxiety and and people that are are um, that really that have anxiety as such a huge thing in their lives, uh, you don't really ever see it as violently portrayed as it is in this trailer. But I can mm-hmm. see how someone who's going through a a, a strong bout with anxiety might see this film and go oh yeah that's that's how i see things like maybe not yeah. not, not in a uh, d- d- uh perceiving reality differently but just like how you see things where p- other people are just walking down the street uh the, the the path from your front door of your apartment to the front door of the building can be beset by all kinds of potential threats and, and dangers um in in someone's yeah. mind's eye so the, the the visuals are really striking. I, I have not seen Hereditary. I did see Midsummer. I echo what you say about how the fact that it is it is a little bit too long. Uh, I do yeah. love I do like that film, um, and it brought us um, Florence Pugh. So I love Florence oh, Pugh. Yeah. Uh, so I I am really optimistic on Bo is Afraid. I don't like the title. And Neither do I. The, the poster... And it, it had a different title. It was The Disappointments Boulevard before. Huh. And I almost like that better than Bo is Afraid. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of, like, if you've ever watched the special features on 40-Year-Old Virgin when they're doing the chest waxing scene. And if, no. if you watch the, the, the special features, uh, Judd Apatow had, like, this big man- manila uh, 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 uh a sandwich board of like just like 30 or 40 handwritten jokes for Steve Carell to yell as they're pulling off the like that Bo is afraid and the title you mentioned they sound like alternate titles that someone came up with that like 
they all like bought a six pack of beer and like we're just went through one by one by one trying to find Bo's the afraid. yeah like <laughs> was afraid and, and and like and by the time they were done they had like no hair on their chest anymore the sp- the six pack of bud light bud light is now gone and they still haven't come up with a good title for the film that's <laughs> That's what I picture when I when <laughs> with this title. Bo is afraid. Like it just uh, it just, yeah. The title doesn't do anything for me, um, but that trailer that trailer kind of is haunting in some ways. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, it is it is high on my list as well. And Ari Aster, yeah, he uh, yeah. talent super talented guy, and um, that uh, this is also on my list. My number three is Ghosted, and uh, Ghosted nice. was on your list as well. Um, I have it higher just because I am, I am high on Ana de Armas. I, I mm-hmm. like so much of what she has done. I think because the Oscars was so much focused on Michelle Yeoh, Michelle Yeoh and every other actress that was brilliant in the Best Actress category, that she really got. Uh, you know, I, I think it was right in that she was nominated for playing Marilyn Monroe, and that is a really tough role to play, and she did a great job doing it. Um, the film being good, but not great, but her, her, her performance is great. So the fact that this is the first film that's of hers, that's coming out after the Oscars, um, is it, is, it's an interesting choice that she is playing now the action star to Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, Chris Evans, who's, who's then going to be the one that he is saving. So she's going to be saving Captain America. Uh, there's something kind of fun and interesting about that. I love the relatively low budget aesthetic that they're going for in the straight to streaming movie, because this is one that's coming straight to Apple TV plus. I think that's probably a smart thing because if it, if it got a the, a wide theatrical release, I don't know that I would be interested in seeing this film. It just looks a little too generic. Yes. It, it kind of has a, um, remember the Tom Cruise, Cameron Diaz movie night and day. Yes, it, it very, kind of, very similar. Yeah, it kind of feels like that a little bit. And because Night and Day was such an awful movie, if this is one that was coming to theaters, I would be a lot quicker to go, that's a low budget Night and Day. But because yeah. it's coming to streaming, um, I kind of go, oh, that looks really interesting. Like, like Right. Yeah, so Marilyn Monroe is going to be saving Captain America. Okay, I can, I can get, behind <laughs> that, get behind that idea. Um, I, I love the idea of Chris Evans being the guy that needs to be saved. I don't buy, you know, if we're assuming that it's that it's a guy that is that looks like Chris Evans, I don't buy that, that a guy that's in that good a shape and that's that good looking would have to go across the pond to pursue a yeah. what he got ghosted by on a date. And I don't believe yeah. that he would not know that he got ghosted. Like there's the scene in the taxi cab where the British taxi driver is like, Oh, so you ghosted, she ghosted you. And he's like, ah, you know, and he's like, like, really? Like, you know, you're, you're Chris Evans and you don't know you got ghosted. Like that part is, is <laughs> like, like, you know, he's not playing a special needs character. So like, like why? Like, right. yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing that part of it more than I do that she's a, a, a secret agent kind of a thing. So that part of it is, you know, it's, but there's something about uh, Honored Armist that it's just, it's hard for me to like really quantify into words, but there's, there's a likability factor with her. 100%. That, that I haven't been overexposed to her, uh, her acting body of work uh, as of yet. Like I've seen her a few things here and there and I've, I've looked up um, different things that she's done, but she hasn't been one that's hit big yet. Like she hasn't gotten like when Margot Robbie was in, um, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. She blew up immediately after that. Like I, right. haven't se- I, I hope that we get a lot more of Ana de Armas, and um, I hope that we don't get sick of her because she is a very talented actress. And I, I think I'm- she's she's definitely take. I like your point, Brian. She's taking the Margot Robbie route almost. Like she's choosing a lot of different types of roles, and I think that's what it shows that you are adaptable and you can do a lot of different things. I think Margot did it and Anna is doing it. She was Marilyn, you know, she was like in an erotic thriller. She's now in action movies. So she's showing her range. So 
I think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of great things to come for Anna de Armas. And you're right. I forgot about the erotic thriller. Can't remember the name of it off the top, but it came out like last last winter. Yeah, it was not that good, but she yeah. was good in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that that's 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 my point is that she is she is a talented actress who hasn't quite hit the uh, that apex of her career yet. So I think she's she's still on the rise. I'm a huge fan of her work. You know, her popping up in a James Bond movie here and there, even if it's just for a cup of coffee. Um, I like that she <laughs> does, does so many different films. I love that this. This looks like an action comedy that she can show that she has a sense of humor, which I think yes. a lot of leading actresses don't get the opportunity to do very often or do very well because everyone's so used to going like, oh, she's pretty. She she can't be funny. She's pretty. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for all those reasons, uh, uh, Ghosted is my number uh, three film. For my number two movie is also Bo is Afraid. And nice. you know, this, this film is just, you know, you hit it on, you hit it on the, on the, on the, the nose when you said it just, it makes you feel something. And, <laughs> you, you know, I think we, you know, especially guys like us where we're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do this movie review thing. You know, we, we watch a lot of trailers and I, you know, I love watching trailers. That's not like a chore or anything, but when you watch a lot of trailers, they tend to, blend together after a while if there's not mm-hmm. something superlative about it and and this film is nothing but superlative mm-hmm. but all of that superlativeness looks like it's there for a reason like any yeah. any kind of a film that that knows what it is uh, you know I, I i like rewarding risk taking but i don't like risk taking for the sake of taking risks like like everything all at once everything about that film is a giant risk, but they did it for a reason. And it just so happens yeah. that every single one of those risks paid off and they're <laughs> rewarded wildly and handsomely and, and Bravo. This is a film yes. that also looks like it takes a lot of risks. Um, you, you know, we, we've seen films like this before. I think uh, there's uh, a couple Jim Carrey movies that, uh, that kind of fall eternal in. sunshine yeah where it kind of reminds me of eternal sunshine it kind of also reminds me of the robin williams movie where um everyone's dead and he's kind of chasing someone through the his ex-wife or his, his wife or his through the afterlife stuff like that when dreams it, may come yes it kind of reminds me a little bit not exactly but it kind of there there's similar elements to this visually in the in the trailer in my mind's eye at least uh, i could be wrong but it, it, it reminds me a little bit mostly eternal sunshine that's kind of my reference point for this but um yeah it, it there there is also something about it where the the subject of anxiety it's sort of an interesting one just based off the trailer alone and the fact that it's joaquin phoenix you know that it's going to be weird we don't know quite what it is yet but it's a whole lot of something yep <laughs> And I'm ready for it. Yeah, <laughs> bring it on! And it's uh, coming out uh, April four or April seventh. So um, soon. Yeah, very soon. And it, you know, I looked. It there's a lot coming out the first weekend in April and the second weekend in April. I couldn't get a bead on whether it's getting a wide release or not, or whether it's a limited release. Is it A24? That's I, A24 released his last two films, so I would assume it's A24. I, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, so if it, if that's the case, they seem to definitely be doing like for all of their films, slow rollouts. So it'll be like LA and New York on April 7th and then slowly build up. So we probably, I mean, you might get it in Vegas a little bit sooner than I will. Um, but I'll probably expect it at the end of April. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, there is, there is a certain, um, there is a certain smartness to that, uh, that kind of a slow rollout. for sure. When it's a quirky film like this, where you 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 send it out to the uh, to the limited release uh, artsy fartsy film theaters, and if it gets word of mouth, and it can get a little bit of a critical role, uh, a little bit of a critical mass, and kind of snowball, um, that which I think is exactly what happened with everything everywhere all at once. Like that, one hundred percent, totally got word of mouth, and people started going to it and started going to it. And um, I don't know if you watch um, Dan Merle's um, yeah. Church, Church with Dan. Uh, he was, as that film was, as Everything Everywhere All at Once was coming out last fall, he, uh, one of the things he does is look at like limited release. And his definition is anything under a thousand theaters. 
And at a certain point, everything everywhere all at once is rollout got so big that it surpassed the limited release and was in over a thousand theaters at a certain point. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see with that release strategy, if Bo is afraid can get that critical mass that right. it, yeah, it comes out April 7th, but most people probably aren't going to see it in their local multiplex it, until, and if it is successful enough to where it comes out, um, gets a wider release in early May, maybe even late May, depending on how long it takes to percolate, to just sit there kind of percolating in that 200, 300, 500 screens. It, this is this is one of those films that if it if it does what the trailer advertises, this mm-hmm. is one of those films that could. I'm not saying it will yeah, or that absolutely. it's likely that it will, but it seems like th- it could grab uh, – just be one of those things that like gets word of mouth and, and eventually it works its way into a very crowded wide release field. Your number one movie for the month of April is my number one is Suzume. And I am so excited for this movie. I've been waiting for it to come out for a couple of years now. Um, but this is from Makoto Shinkai. Uh, and he's become very well known in the States because he uh, directed Your Name, which is probably one of the best anime films to he have come Dragon out. directed Dragon Movie Guy? The movie? <laughs> oh, the, mo- the movie. DMG, the Your movie. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, so he, yeah, he uh, directed Your Name, which has became a huge hit in the States, and it's just an incredibly beautiful film. Uh, And then also Weathering With You, which came out about three years ago. So this is a director, like, watching every single frame in his films, it's beautiful. And uh, even if the story with Weathering With You wasn't as strong as your name, but it still packed such an emotional wallop, and he's really able to create these uh, very grounded stories, but that are also filled with fantasy. And okay. I'm just so excited to see what he does next. Were his other films anime um, style animation as well? Yes. Um, so all I'm familiar with is Your Name. And um, I know he's been around for a while, but Your Name was like his big, his big break. He also, oh yeah, The Place Promised in our early days uh, as well, which is great. And then the Garden of Words. When you uh, put Suzumi on your list, I I, I didn't. Uh, so I looked it up and I watched the trailer. And I had to watch it a couple times. What would you describe the story as being? Because it I, it, I it looks no like idea. a whole lot of different stuff. I mean, I, I don't know quite what I saw. <laughs> I know the animation looks really good, but what what would you say the story looks like? It's about. So I felt the same way about his last film, uh, Weathering with You. It was like, what is this about? All I know, it's about water and the weather. Like, that's literally... um, So, what it says is, it's a modern action-adventure road story where a 17-year-old girl named Suzume helps a mysterious young man close doors from the other side that are releasing disasters all over in Japan. Um, and so weathering with you definitely had to do with like weather storms and like natural disasters and stuff, but playing around with weather and rain and storms. So this kind of looks on the same level. Um, but like I said, his movies are very character driven, very grounded, but like fantasy. So you have to like let go of what your expectations are of like, I don't know how to explain it. But just like, just open your mind up to like a fantasy world where there are no rules, kind of. And and I, uh, you know, I am not a uh, anime super fan. I've you know watched a few ones here and there. You know, I saw uh, Akira for you know years ago, and I've yeah. watched a few here and there. Um, it it was interesting watching this trailer because it kind of looked like it jumped between that Akira like really edgy like ah kind of thing. It looked like it jumped between that more adult kind of thing and the uh the nickelodeon style anime like it, it looks like it jumps like in, in between shots even is what it kind of kind of sort of looked like i could be completely wrong it's just 
my interpretation of watching the trailer. It looked like it was sure. jumping between those two things. And it's interesting when you talk about the doors too, like I, it kind of, that reminds me of like the adjustment bureau a little bit, not in Fair. style, but just like <laughs> in terms of like plot device and like, and yeah, yeah this, it, it, this trailer looks so bizarre. I don't, that's why I was asking you like, what do you, what does this story even look like it's about? Cause right. it, it's, it looks visually stunning. Um, and the animation quality looks re- so well done, uh, but it's yeah. just it's just hard for me to like wrap my hat hat, hat around like, okay, what is this? What is the story here? <laughs> yeah, but from the director and from just Makoto Shinkai, knowing him, it's going to be just absolutely beautiful. There's going to be some incredible action sequences and set pieces, and it's also going to have a whole lot of heart. So all of his films are very emotional. And um, I mean, every single one of his films that I've seen um, have made me cry. So I don't know. I'm ready for an experience. And that's what he he gives. Nice. And that's why it's number one on your list, because I, I have not yeah. heard of him uh, of him as a director before. And I've not heard of his movies before. So uh, that, that is part of the, the, that is one of the things why I love having you on, because. Uh, I have not heard of him or his movies before, so the fact that th- this is showing up at number one on your list of anticipated movies, that's part of the discussion. That is why I yeah. I love talking about movies. So um, so Suzumi is the, the name of the lead female character in, in this film. And so, interesting. Yes. My number one movie for the month of April is Showing Up. This is a film with a lot of recent oscar nominees that just showed up uh or that were just in the oscars last uh last sunday uh michelle williams is in this film hong chow is in this film andre 3000 is in this film this is michelle williams playing a frustrated artist who's trying to build up to a show and hong chow is the artist who's preparing for two shows and she has time to relax. So why doesn't Michelle Williams have time to relax? Because she has two shows and to Michelle Williams is one. Um, I, I love artsy movies like this. And the fact that um, I'm not familiar with Kelly Reichert's work before. But when you see a good character-driven type film like this. Kelly she directed Reichert, First Cow. Yeah, First Cow, Old Joy, Certain Women. So not... Wendy and Lucy, so not films that have a particular wide release strategy, but in the indie film world, to see Michelle Williams come fresh off an Oscar nomination, um, playing a frustrated artist, preparing for that big show, but knowing that she's being outstaged a little bit. She, you know, the the what it was, it, and this is the second time I'm referencing it, but it's it sort of looks like Michelle Williams is playing Solieri to Hong Chao's Mozart. <laughs> A, a little bit obviously like that. in a in a very modern sense but she's you know she's the one who's talented for being in her family but she's not the auteur she's not the she's not the once in a generation talent so um yeah. there's just something about that dynamic of someone who's talented but not generationally talented and um that is why showing up is my number one film uh for the month of april kelly Riker. um i saw first cow her I haven't seen Wendy and Lucy, which I know has Michelle Williams in it. Um, but her movies are very, from what I've heard and what I got from First Cow, very understated, very low-key movies uh, that kind of just really take their time to build up. So definitely not for everybody, but uh, with Michelle Williams and Hong Chow, uh, I, I definitely want to see that. <laughs> and 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 after seeing Hong, you know, and after Hong Chow getting her first Oscar nomination and also showing up in the menu. Um, it's interesting because yes. I had never seen Hong Chao before last year. So it is interesting seeing her get to be uh, in all these film, these high profile, both commercially mm-hmm. successful and artsy, artsy, fartsy, artsy, uh, Oscar favorite style films yeah. now, all at once. So it's, it's fun seeing her, um, kind of get that that uh, critical praise and uh, Hollywood yes. recognition for her talents, re- you know, relatively quickly in terms of fame. So what uh, amazing lists! I'm yes. excited for April. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's funny because I, I um, it, it's it's that weird time of year where we're post holidays but pre summer, 
So April kind of sort of is the unofficial beginning of summer in some ways. Like we've been getting a lot yeah. of, we've been getting a lot of fast and furious style movies coming out in April. So it is interesting that, you know, we, we can do our, our, our April list and have a huge wide variety of different movies. We've got horror oh, films, yeah. uh, artsy, you know, art house films. We got, uh, a little bit of everything in the- animation yeah. thriller we have we do have a nice mix of films and it's just a lot of a lot of fun stuff to occupy our attention for the next month um yeah it was interesting when i was looking up and making up my list there were 25 movies scheduled for release on that list for april at least according to wikipedia and that did mm. that did not include at least three or four movies on your list so there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of movies coming to um to on demand to you know to the streaming services and of course to theaters as well so this looks april looks like it's going to be an amazing fun uh month to to watch you know pretty much whatever whatever style of movie it looks like that that you like it this is, April looks like a really good month for going to the theaters. Thank you for coming on, Sean. Uh, I Thank don't want to so keep much. it too too long here. Um, what uh, what uh, what would you like to talk about? What's coming up for you on your channel and what's coming up with the Cinema Squad? Um, so on my channel, I'm just gonna be doing a lot of reviews uh, of. Uh, a lot of the films that I've talked about today on my list, I'm going to try to uh, every month, try to tackle at least all the films that I'm most, my most anticipated films of that month. Um, so I'll be concentrating on that and a couple of TV shows as well. And for the cinema squad, unfortunately off to the races is over, uh, but we're going to be more concentrating on doing like spoiler reviews. Like we just did with, uh, with scream uh, the boys are going to be talking about the Mandalorian season three and uh, yeah. So we're going to keep that up as well. So definitely check out both of those channels lost in the real and the cinema squad. One of the things I love about your individual reviews on lost in the real is you have a great energy um, for the reviews that you're doing, but also you do a lot of indie films that are mm-hmm. not you know, like, you, you know, you cover all the big releases, but you do a lot of the indie films that, usually don't get a good movie review like you know you'll see every once in a while you'll see someone coming out of a film at 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 a at sundance or whatever and you'll get a 30 second youtube short or something but you do fully produced movie reviews on every indie movie that i can think of (laughs) as they're coming out so i i I love your uh your movie reviews and and your style and um and especially the fact that you're covering a lot of a lot of films that don't get a proper movie review. I think you do a really good job of shining that light on those films that don't, that don't get, uh, you know, our, our space is oversaturated in a lot of different ways, but a lot of the films that you cover don't get a, a lot of really good movie quality movie reviews done. So that, that is one thing that I really love about last in the real as a channel. So thank you, Brian. That means a lot. And that's definitely what I'm going for. So I'm happy that it's working. <laughs> Thank, uh, so thank you for coming on, Sean, and uh, thank you everybody for watching, and I will see you next time.